Uh, do we have kids ministry today? No? No, no kids ministry today. Uh, by the way, I've got to talk to you. There's one that wants to volunteer. Also, uh, if you want to volunteer in kids ministry or if you want to volunteer in, if you know instruments, uh, if you know how to yeah, play instruments, not know of instruments, but know how to play instruments and sing and you would want to be a part of something like that, I would love to talk with you after the service. So just keep that in mind. But it's a joy to be with you today. Uh, we're going to be going into Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, for those of you who may be new or don't know me, my name is Gunnar. I'm one of the pastors here, and I just want to say welcome. Uh, if any of you have questions about the sermon or about faith in general, I believe that uh, the concept of having blind faith is not a biblical concept. Uh, so I, for instance, am just here because I had a lot of questions that came from a very young age uh, about God. And if we really start to think about it, the way we know people is we start to ask them questions about well, starting off with their name and where they're from and what they like to do and what they do to work, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, if you have questions about anything that's being said, anything that's being done, uh, or anything about faith in general, I'm here after the service. And, uh, but the difficult questions go to Daniel Maxson over here. So I'm um, just kidding. Today we're going to be dwelling on Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, verses 1 through 4, and what we're going to be dwelling on is this concept is who is your functional authority? Now notice the word functional in there is not who is your confessional authority or confessed authority, who, who do you say is the Lord over your life, but functionally, uh, what does your life testify of who is your authority ultimately? And today we're going to be picking up in chapter 2 in the book of Hebrews. Uh, if you don't know, we kind of most of the time, we're working our way through the books of the Bible so that God gets to say what is next on our agenda instead of just me coming up with topics every single week. And uh, last week, we, or last two weeks, we wrapped up chapter one. Uh, there's a couple of things that we learned there. Uh, the theme of, of the book of Hebrews is very much Jesus is better than blank. And he's comparing Jesus to a lot of Old Testament realities and showing how Jesus is better in any way. And uh, so in chapter 1, he lays out that Jesus is better than a prophet simply bringing a message. Rather, Jesus isn't simply bringing a message. He is the very message itself, that there is grace, there is restoration, there is hope in Jesus Christ. And, and in the latter half of chapter 1, he is laying out this idea that Jesus is better than, uh, than angels, He's not simply a, a vague spiritual being. Uh, we live in a day and age where it's very popular to be vaguely spiritual. Um, and like I said last week, you know, people sometimes, most of the time when they hear I'm a pastor, it goes awkwardly silent and they don't want to talk about anything in their life. But sometimes it happens that they hear I'm a pastor and they'll say, I'm spiritual too. And one of the things that we were dwelling on uh, last week is Spiritual is not really enough, right? The devil is spiritual, angels are spiritual, God is spiritual. It's a very broad concept. Um, so he is better than simply another angel because he is the sustainer of life itself, the unseen and the seen. So before we jump into the text, I want to say this. Very often, the gravity of what is said um, can change depending on who is saying it. And, and even if it's good or not, can change on, depending on who's saying it. For example, let me, let, let me give you this scenario. If someone, you're in a situation and someone is saying to you, I need to cut you open, right? Now, those words are never fun to hear, but the circumstances in which you would interpret is this a positive thing or a negative thing would depend heavily on who is saying this to you, right? I... I'm going to cut you open. Well, for one, if, if, it's, uh, you know, if it's a gangster that's going to show himself off to be a bad dude, <laughs> as the movies would call it, uh, man, that is a bad scenario. We don't want to be in that scenario at all. Now, on the other hand, if it's a doctor saying, I'm going to cut you open, again, it's not a positive thing to hear. But if it's in the context of, man, I'm going to cut you open so that I can remove the disease that is slowly killing you, then all of a sudden the context brings a whole new light 
to what is said, depending on who is saying it. And so as we read our four verses today, that's similar to what the author of Hebrews is saying. This is not starting sort of a totally new thought, but rather he's continuing on his, his letter to the Hebrews. Um, now, if you don't know this, uh, if you start to read your uh, New Testament, a lot of them are simply letters. And I think for a lot of us, we would be bothered if someone read our letters like we read the Bible, right? <laughs> Imagine you, read, uh, you write a letter right now and people 1,500 years later find it and start giving your letter chapters and verses and they start reading one verse a day out of context to the whole rest of the letter, it would probably bother you the conclusions that people would come to about what you were trying to say. So remember that. As we dwell on Hebrews, it is a letter in the Bible. And so we are in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. But he's continuing on this thought that Jesus is better. He's better than simply another prophet with a message. He's better than a vague spiritual being. And let me see if this is catching on. So the first word that we read in chapter 2 is the word, therefore, and I want to ask us, what, what do we ask when we see the word therefore? No one? What is it there for? Yes, Christian. Ten stars. No, it's good. <laughs> I saw some of you. So if you're reading your Bibles and you come to a word that says therefore, you have to ask, what is the therefore there for? It's a great reminder. It's cheesy, I know, but it helps you remember. Keep context in mind. What is the therefore Therefore, what is it tying to? What thought is continuing? So would you stand with me today as we read our verses in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be, more, uh, to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Amen. You may be seated. So the title of the sermon today is this title, Who is Your Functional Authority? Um, here in our church, we believe that our highest authority for uh, both not only what we believe but how we live is this book right here that has 66 books or letters in it. Um, this is what we look to to find uh, who God is, how we should behave, how we should live in light of who he is. And just as I mentioned before, uh, when I mentioned the, the thug and the doctor, depending on who is saying, I'm going to cut you open, it, it changes the meaning a lot. We believe that Jesus is the great physician. I love this. Jesus, when he came, he offended a lot of religious people, right? All the religious people who were the religious elites with a bunch bunch of trinkets and nice things and nice robes who were the respected the theologians they they were the ones trying to crucify Jesus right they totally missed the point and in Mark chapter 2 we see that they're actually offended that Jesus is coming to these really obviously messed up people right not religiously messed up people like they were that hide their messed up ness if that's a word uh, but rather they were saying why is he hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. If you're supposed to be so holy, why is this the company that you choose? And what does he say? He says, hey, it's not the well-off that need the physician. It's those who are sick. Now, they might have been like, yeah, okay, yeah, I guess that has a point. Not realizing they're the ones who are sick. They just have a different kind of sickness, thinking that they have it all together while not remembering the pure, awesome, and holy nature of God. Now, I remember as a little kid, at around six years old, one of my sisters, I have this vivid memory. Uh, I have like, just glimpses of memory. Like, I don't have a lot, but I have this one memory where one of my sisters, and I'm the very youngest in my family, so everyone moved out when I was like three years old, so I feel 
I feel basically like an only child sometimes. But I remember one of my sisters was at home, and she was crying because she was having financial difficulty. And I came up with the perfect solution. I told her, not to worry, sister. I will take care of your problems. Right? And I remember her laughing through her tears a little bit because she was thankful for the thought behind it that I wanted to take care of her problems, but she realized that her problems were well beyond my capability to take care of them. And I offered, I, I, I thought, okay, we're going to go with a nuclear option here. If you don't think I can do this, then... Uh, I'll break open my piggy bank if I need to. You know, like, like we'll, I'll take care of this. I, I'll take out the big guns and we will destroy this problem that you have. And still, she laughed. Probably realizing that my few hundred kroners in the piggy bank were probably not going to do anything for the grandeur of her problem. They would not go away. And you see, when we dwell on the book of Hebrews and he keeps saying Jesus is better, there's life-changing application in all of the points that the author of Hebrews is saying, Jesus is better than the prophet. He's better than an angel. He's better than the Shabbat. He's better than the rest in the Old Testament. He's better than a Saturday off, right? He is better than the sacrifice of the temple. That's, that's what we're about to go into the rest of the book of Hebrews. He's saying, this in the Old Testament is just a shadow of the substance. And you guys are dwelling in the shadow. You're mesmerized by the shadow. And yet, the Lord of it is right here, and you miss him. He is better. And you, we might be able to think, to say, oh, okay, it's it's quite a lot to be just talking about how Jesus is better than this and that and blah, blah, blah. No, there is life-changing application in every single Jesus is better category that we think about. Because when we're thinking about Jesus is better, we are realizing that he's not just like me at six years old offering to deal with a problem that he's in no way capable of dealing with. The author of Hebrews is saying, no, 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 no. Stop talking about how huge your problems are, and realize that Jesus is better. Jesus is better than all of it. And it has life-changing application. Like, for, for instance, like in the first verse of uh, the, our first verse today, he says, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. So in light of Jesus being better, who is my functional authority? What am I bringing close attention to? Who am I listening to? What am I allowing to inform how I live and how I think and how I behave? Because this is not simply another created being. This is not simply another philosopher or a great religious leader, nor someone coming to us with good intentions, but unable to fix any of our problems. Here's the thing. When we put the word of God as our highest authority, because we believe that God is good, and we believe that his teaching to us is actually, this is crazy, for our benefit and for our flourishing. And, and this might offend you a little bit. We believe that Jesus, the all-knowing one, knows better than you about how life is best lived. We believe that he is the creator and we are his creation and that everything else in creation is subject to Jesus. And we believe that even while denying ourselves, even while saying no to our flesh or no to the world around us that would like to distract us with a million different things, like I've said a few times, notice that there's no one frowning in commercials. Have you noticed that? If you're driving a Nissan, you're happy as ever. If you're putting on makeup, you're happy as ever. Have you noticed that? No one's sad in commercials. What's the underlying message there? Just drink this nasty drink and you'll be happy, right? No. We believe that in the end, the path to true and lasting joy is to be wherever the author of life is. And, and here's how this applies practi practically to our lives. For one, we want to be people who read the word of God, right? Because we live in an awesome day and age, like Iceland is a crazy environment. Did you know that Iceland has more than a million Icelandic Bibles in circulation right now, and yet no one reads them. <laughs> They're just gathering dusts in storage spaces and on shelves, probably looking nice while people eat underneath them, not realizing what a single word in there says. 
So we definitely want to be practically, when we think about this words, therefore we must pay closer attention to what we have heard. One of the ways we apply that to our life is to say, okay, God has given us these Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we've got like, it seems like a really disorganized stack of them in the back. And we're fine if you steal a Bible. That's the best thing that you could steal from us today. Uh, no, but you're not stealing. We have them so that you can take them home. But we want to be people who read the Word of God. And more than that, oh, by the way, if you don't have a plan for reading the Word of God, we have these in the back as well. So these are just, just what you can read every single day if you want to, both the New Testament and the entire Bible. You don't have to go by the week. You can simply use this as a checkoff list of what you've read so far. Now, more than that, we don't want to just people who, who be we don't want to just be people who know a bunch of things about God. And we don't want to just be people who can quote to you scriptures and do mental gymnastics and theology. We want to let the word of God inform our heads and then not stop there, but to drip down to our hearts and transform our hearts and then to go into our hands to equip them, becoming our functional authority, right? Because the reality is a lot of people will say the right things. Amen? Amen? Yeah? Yeah? I could just ask, hey, can you say amen to this? And we can all say amen. Yeah, so be it, right? We can say amen to all the right things. And then we can go out here and not display anything, any, anything that we've learned. Right? Like our... Our hope is that God would inform us of who he is, that it would transform our hearts in what we love and what we give our attention to, and that it would change how we live, how we use our hands and our energy and so on and so forth. Uh, because the, the problem is, a lot of people are theoretical Christians, but functional atheists, right? right? We, we believe that God is there, but we don't behave that way when it comes to prioritizing our lives, right? We believe that God can come and heal our problems, but functionally, he is the very last one we turn to to actually fix our problems, right? We might start with a budget and all this like type of stuff. Like he is the very last resort. And so theoretically, a lot of us will say yes and amen. God, Jesus is Lord. He can fix anything. And yet functionally, who is our authority? So as we go into our, you know, like as, as we go over in our membership class, what we want to be is a church that starts to live functionally as if Jesus Christ is literally raised up to life, as if Jesus Christ is literally the one giving us strength, as if he's literally in the, with us in the valley of the shadow of death and on the mountaintops of life. And so in our membership class, we, we talk about the, the five T's, right? Because we're Baptists and we have to have things that uh, start with the same letter sometimes, and even though it's a stretch, sometimes, right? So we want to be people who use our time in a godly way, our talents in a godly way. Uh, we want to use our treasures, uh, our teaching, the, the things that we listen to, the things that inform us about God. We want to be wise about who we listen to, what books we read, and so on and so forth. And lastly, we want to use our tongue in an upbuilding and godly way to make sure, man, not only that we're not being foul-mouthed, but that also we're sharing the faith with people, that we're not gossiping or destroying people. Um, and I realize I got to be careful with my gestures. <laughs> it's like, right, Anna, that we're not gossiping. Or <laughs> that's, that's, it's like I need to be careful with my hands <laughs> so that people don't get like wrong ideas about what people are doing here. <laughs> so when Hebrews says that we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, He's not simply asking us to, man, read your Bible slowly. But rather, be changed in light of this. Like, read your Bible and realize there's a living God and a promise of a living God living inside of you, changing you to look more like Jesus, and ask him to do that. And so remember, like, this is the Great Commission that we read every week. And sometimes I wonder if we should, because sometimes if you do it, do things over and over again, we just kind of lose the meaning of it, maybe forget to really dwell on this. We end our services by reminding us what is our mission. Notice in verse 20, 
when he says, okay, go out to all the nations, make disciples of all the nations, and this is not just for the pastors or people with microphones, this is for all of us, right? Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Now, a lot of people read these words and they think, oh, okay, I'm going to teach them everything that Jesus taught. No, 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 that's not what the text says. Teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. Teach them to live in light of this radical teaching. Don't just let them know what I said. Show them what a life looks like to the glory of God. Go out and make disciples that way. And it's getting incredibly difficult at times. <laughs> because back in this day, the church was your next door neighbor that was like plowing his field, right? And you could take breaks whenever you wanted. You could hang out with them. You could share your lives together. And I'm like, man, God, how do we do this in our modern age where some of us have 30-minute lunches and others of us are working during night shifts? And how do we share our lives together as one? Well, you guys figure that out and let me know. No. But let's stop right here and encourage you here. Brothers and sisters, spend time in prayer with God developing a godly vision for how you want to use your time. How do you want to use your talents? Don't believe the lies that you have nothing to offer. Don't believe the lies that somehow you're the only one except from the promises of God to all of God's people. Oh, yep, yeah, I know that he promises gifts of the Holy Spirit to all of us to build up the church, but somehow he just forgot me out of the billions. <laughs> just... That's how unlucky I am. No, he's gifted you with gifts to build up the people around you and to use them. So when you're missing on Sundays, man, we don't want to just be about like some kind of uh, like event. <laughs> I think you're like, yeah, Gunnar, you're making that very clear by playing Spotify, right? <laughs> um, we don't want to be about an event. We want to be a family of faith that's actually encouraging one another involved in each other's lives. And I can't do that to all of you. We need each other. So what I want you to realize is when, when one of us is missing, Sundays, Bible studies, whatever, if you're not plugged in, get plugged in because not only are you missing out on all the people around you that have gifts to build you up in faith and knowledge, but we're missing out on you and what you have to offer to build us up in faith and knowledge. And I love when the Bible talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it goes from an incredibly broad range to like prophesy to acts of service. <laughs> Maybe that you just don't think that your gift is like huge. But man, what the Bible tells us is we're one body. If one of us is missing, <laughs> imagine it, your body. If Take a small member of your body like a, a pinky, right? It's not big. You know what happens if you chop this thing off? You're still going to hurt. <laughs> You're still going to hurt a lot. Uh, we don't say that to our body. Ah, oh, we can lose a pinky or both even. You know, like, no, no, no. The whole body starts to hurt. And that's what the Bible teaches us, man. So let me encourage you with, with this. Like, get a godly vision for your life. How are you going to use the talents that God gave you? How are you going to use your money and your resources at your disposal for his glory? Now, let me tell you this. I, I feel like, man, a lot of the times there are two camps. So uh, some churches, you'll be like, man, you're so godly. If you're rich, God obviously loves you and you're blessed. And man, the rest of us are just worms that God doesn't love, you know, that type of stuff. If you're really loved by God, then you're rich. And then you have other groups of people. It's like, no, 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 no. If you're really loved by God, you're going to suffer in this life. You're going to suffer and you're going to smile about it. You know, that, that type of stuff. Right? And I... I tend to warn about the two ditches on either side of the road. I think the, the answer is somewhere in the middle, right? You, and, and the people who are like, look, look, it's King Solomon. He's the richest man on earth, you know. And, and then the other guy is like, well, look at Stephen. He was, you know, <laughs> he was killed. <laughs> like, that's a, and um, I think the thing is, whatever God blesses you with, be it riches, be it suffering, be lost, seek faithfulness, right? Whatever he gives you, seek faithfulness. View yourself not, as not an owner or a ruler, but rather a servant and a steward of what God has gifted to you. 
to build up the people around you. Don't fall into these extremes. Just say, God, whatever you give me, let me be faithful. Let me be faithful. Spend time in prayer and think what kind of, of teaching you want to take into your life. What audiobooks are you listening to? What podcasts are you listening to? Even this, what movies or TV shows are you watching? Some of them are teaching you uh, uh, like in really obvious ways about worldview and how you should view the world, and others are really subtle about it. But lastly, prayerfully develop a godly vision for, how, for, for your life as to how you will use your tongue. How are you going to use your tongue? What are you going to speak about? Who are you going to speak about? Are you going to use it to share the gospel, to encourage people, or to slander people? But then he ends verse 1 by saying, pay closer attention to what you have heard, lest we drift away from it. Now notice the we in there, right? It's not the computer, right? No, I'm just kidding. He's addressing the Christians. And this letter is addressing Christians, not those outside of the church. This is a letter written to Christians saying, hey, you can't control what other people do in the world or how the world behaves. You focus on what you take in what you learn, and how you live. If you're not grounded in the truth of God, if you don't fight for time to spend with God, someone will make your schedule for you. (laughs) It's amazing today that just, have you tried scrolling to the end of Facebook? It It doesn't end. You can just keep doing that. Waste your life away. Scrolling. If you don't fight for time to spend with God, And take steps towards glorifying God. If you don't set the agenda for your life, someone or something else will. And so we come again to this question of functional authority. Who is your functional authority? Is Netflix your functional authority? Is your hobby your functional authority? (laughs) So I'm not going to point people out that make faces here. Uh, We live in a generation of people (laughs) that I think will have a lot of regret on their deathbed. Right? Because once they see death is drawing closer, they will realize that they have never actually been intentional about living for the right things, walking the right path, spending time according to what's actually important to them. Dear Christian, and the spiritual warfare happening for your soul may not be the devil trying to get you to jump into some kind of heresy. It may simply to say, hey, I'm going to get Daniel to walk one degree off the path, right? And I'm just going to get him to walk one degree. That's not a lot. That's, that's like the, the smallest number, right? One degree. But I'm just going to get him to walk one degree off the path and do it for long enough. And man, when you do that for six months, and that becomes a year, and that becomes 10 years, and then that becomes decades, and you're on your deathbed, you look back and you realize you're nowhere near the path that God wanted you to be on. That's how spiritual war for your soul may be fought. Man, if I can't get them away from Christ to renounce their faith, at least let me get them off the path so that they're ineffective Christians, realizing only at the end of their lives that they didn't live well. See, we live on the first floor. We had a mouse problem. We have a mouse problem almost every year. Around this time of year when it's getting cold, the mice want to get warm. And uh, I just don't want them to be warm in my house. <laughs> and we're tri- trying to figure out ways how to, how to get the mice, right? I'm trying to be humane. They're beautiful. Uh, but still not beautiful enough to keep them in my house as pets. Uh, now, when, as I was researching this, do you know this? Like, you, to poison a uh, rodent or whatever, you don't just lay a bowl of poison saying, hey, come here, get yourself killed. You, like, mask it in stuff. You mask it in things that look nice, that smell nice, that taste nice. And then you just put like 1% poison in there. And that will do the job for you. And that's the problem with drifting. And he says, lest we drift away from it. Drifting doesn't require any effort. You don't really have to do anything. If you have a boat, all you need to do is to be without an anchor. And then effortlessly the boat will start to drift away from its environment. Not suddenly, not dramatically, but slowly and steadily drifting away to the people in the boat. It might not even seem like a big deal. 
In Acts chapter 16, the Apostle Paul, he's asked this question, what must I do to be saved? Well, his answer to that question is, hey, change your direction. Turn to Christ. Believe in the Lord. Follow Christ. Trust that his sacrifice can save you, that when you stand before God, you're not coming saying, look at all the nice stuff I did, but rather, look at what Christ has done. Trust in his teaching for your life and follow him. But what if we took this man's question, Shurs, what's what must I do to be saved? And we ask the opposite question. Sir, what must I do to be lost? Well, the answer to that is nothing. You don't have to do anything. Because the reality is a dead fish can, can uh, go with the stream. A dead fish can flow downstream with the current. It takes someone who's alive to swim against the current. And the Bible warns us that, man, we, we are in the world, but we shouldn't be of the world. The current around us will take us in one direction. If we're not intentional about saying, man, I want a godly vision for my life, we are going to be swept away by a current. And it's not going to be God's will for your life. If you're not intentional about getting a godly agenda for your life, someone will set an agenda for you. And you will simply float with whatever stream is flowing that day. And the fruit of that stream seems more and more to become, become visible and show itself to be rather bad. And so what streams do we find ourselves in? In today's day and age, we find you know, our, ourselves in the stream of finding freedom from guardrails of, of godly faith or just morality. And the fruit of that is not actually, ironically enough, it's not freedom at all, but rather bondage. All of a sudden, we become a culture that is in total bondage and slavery to our very impulses. We can't say no to anything. We're just drifting from one thing to another. A society not grounded in reality. Individuals not walking around with purpose. Just simply entertaining themselves to a spiritual and eternal death. And so our protection against drifting is to place our faith in Jesus as the anchor of our life and the anchor that holds us to the truth and to ask him to be our Lord and the rudder of our life. God, take me to where you want me to be. And that's exactly what uh, Hebrews 2, uh, 2 to 4 says. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation, it was declared at first by the Lord and it was attested to us by those who heard. Well, God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So what is he saying there? Well, he's, he's looking at Deuteronomy chapter 33 in verse 2. It, it talks about uh, the law of God coming down from Mount Sinai. The author of Hebrews is saying, since, man, the Old Testament came with angels when delivering the law of God in the Old Testament, and we took that seriously, man, how will we then take it, how will we then escape if we neglect to take seriously not simply another messenger, but rather God himself who is the message? If we take the delivery of angels seriously, how can we take seriously, the, how can we not take seriously the gift of salvation, not only in a message, but in a messenger. Now, he came not to deliver us rules. Man, can we say amen to that? <laughs> like, I'm thankful. When, uh, I'm not saying, man, throw the rules out the window. That's not biblical either. But I'm just thankful that Jesus, he could have simply walked around and said, what is wrong with you people? Why don't you just do what you know to be good and don't do what you know to be bad? Just do that. You know, he could have just simply been another one pointing to the rules and how we fail. And yet he didn't. He didn't come just with rules, but rather to deliver a hope, a message of hope for those of us who have already failed, right? Can we get an amen to that? Have you failed? Yeah, amen, so be it. We live, who have failed the law, we've fallen, we've broken the law, and here comes the great physician saying, hey, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, it's the sick, and I'm here, the great physician. I was quoting Jesus, I was not saying I'm here, right, <laughs> I hope you get that. 
we would be, if we were to not take this man seriously, we would be people like taking soldiers and police officers seriously. And then when a king comes, who is the very authority over those police officers or soldiers, then we would not listen to what he has to say at all. That's how stupid we would be. If we were to take the message delivered by angels seriously and not the messenger that was God himself. And here's the one coming to tell us not simply what we must do, but rather what he has done in Jesus Christ. Have you failed to be perfect? Chris, have you, have you failed yet? You were on a pretty good streak, right? No, I'm just We've all failed to be perfect. Well, here's the one who is perfect, and he's taken it upon himself to die as if he were a sinner, to pay your debt, to wipe away your shame so that you can live in the perfect righteousness of Jesus. And this was the message of Jesus. When he starts his ministry in Matthew chapter 4, it says, this is the message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As in, repent, turn away. Turn away from whatever was your functional authority before. Turn to Christ. Let him be your functional authority and real authority. For the kingdom of God is here. And you'll not only have promises of life, but you'll be turning to the one who's capable to deliver on his promises because he is the very author and sustainer of life. Now, do you dread death in here? I think that's not a fun th thought for any of us, but are you the one who's just completely dreadful of, when you think about death? Turn to the physician who has eternal life. Do, do you tremble at the thought of standing before the judgment seat of God and not, not being found good enough to come into heaven? Well, I have news for you. The bad news is none of us are good enough. Turn to the one who is, who died to give you his righteousness. He died your death so that you could have his life. Do not neglect this great salvation. If, there's, if something is great to you, you give it your time, your energy, your focus. If, if what is great in your eyes is being powerful or successful, you're going to give attention to that, right? If what is great in your eyes, if you're one of those weird people who just loves to be in school until you're 45 and have five different degrees and all that, like some kind of letters before your name, if that is great in your eyes, you're going to give your attention, your focus to that thing. But we have to ask ourselves, what is great in our eyes? We are saved by a great Savior at a great cost from a great penalty. This salvation is great. Now, why do many neglect that? Because they never see salvation as great. Perhaps due to blindness of the holiness of God, the seriousness of sin and hell, maybe, the length of eternity. A lot of us live as functional atheists because we don't have eternity in mind. We just want our best 80 years right now, and that's all we have in mind, not thinking about what is to come. But brothers and sisters, may we not fall into the trap of being irreverent or being short-sighted or flippant with holy things or unconcerned about the eternal state of our souls and the souls of those around us. And he says this message of hope, it was declared at first by the Lord and it was attested to us by those who heard. Now what is he saying there? Well, first of all, notice that he's saying us. So we find out that this letter is not written hundreds of years after the life of Jesus Christ, he's saying, no, 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 we saw Jesus. We heard about those who attested of his life and what he's done. This is not another fairy tale. It's not another nice story or fantasy. It was declared by God himself in human form. And the church from the very first century gave themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, the New Testament is written by people who encountered Jesus who saw Jesus live and then die and then, surprise, live again, right? And a lot of them, like you think about one of the books in your New Testament is called James. And if you don't know anything about James, you know, like you read that thing and you find out James is the half-brother of Jesus. Now, there's a lot of jokes in there about what it was like living life with Jesus as your older brother, you know? Mary saying, James, can't you be more like Jesus and all that type of stuff? I can't imagine but here's one thing. If you read the Gospels, you find out that his family thought Jesus was crazy. 
They're like, no, I'm not going to worship you. And then you find out that ult- like something happened. So at one point in the Gospels, they thought Jesus was crazy. And then later on, you find out, wait a minute, his brother is writing a book in the Bible, worshiping his older brother as Jesus? Have you thought about how crazy that is? Right? How, what would it take for you to worship your older sibling as, as God in, in human form, perfect in nature? What would it take? I'm telling you, as someone with three older siblings, you cannot convince me at all. <laughs> you can torture me. I will not admit that at all. And here's the crazy thing. That man died rather than to renounce his faith in his older brother as the perfect God. Right? So here, he's, see, he's writing to Christian. like He's writing early. He's saying, man, we saw these things. We listened to those who heard him. And the early church did this. They gave themselves to the apostles' teaching. And we want to do the same. But for us to give ourselves to live in light of of the teaching, our first step is to actually know what the teaching is about. But before we go out there and it's like, all right, one, two, three, let's go live for Jesus. We need to first figure out what Jesus actually taught. And just for a moment, let me address possible skepticism. Now, you might run into these people. You might be one of those people that says, hey, there's no evidence that Jesus ever existed. I would propose to you this. If you're truly going to hold to that view, you cannot be certain about any other person in all of written human history to ever exist. There is more written about Jesus, more documentation about Jesus, both from the people who followed him and died for him and the people who were trying to shut down his believers. Right? There's more documentation about the life and the work and the message of Jesus than any other person in human history. So raise your hands. Do you believe Aristotle was a real person? Four of us? Man, Aristotle's really like lost his reputation lately. Uh, do you believe that Plato was a real person? Anybody in here? Yeah? Okay. Do you believe Augustus Caesar was a real person? Anybody? Yeah? We got a lot of skeptics in this room, I got to say. Uh, none of the other people that we take for granted as being real people and real human history have as much documentation about their lives as Jesus Christ. And none of them have documentation as close to the life of uh, their life as to Jesus Christ. Not only is there more documentation about Jesus, the earliest manuscripts that we have are written very early on after the lifetime of Jesus. Archaeology and history is continuing to find out that, oh, we thought the Bible was wrong here. And actually, if we use the Bible and we dig where it says that this thing was, it's there. But man, if you run into these people and you say, man, Jesus wasn't a real person, just say, man, you've got to be, you've got to then let go of all of human history before and after Jesus because there's no one attested to more. And lastly, no other person in human history without military power, financial power, or political power has left the dent in the universe like Christ has, right? We literally, like you can't run away from him. You want to schedule a meeting next Tuesday? That's next Tuesday on the year 2023 after our Lord. Like, here is the point. We measure history before, like, with him in the middle, before he arrived and after he arrived. And that's crazy to think about. With no military power, no political power, no financial power. Can you imagine standing at the cross where people are mocking Jesus and trying to convince them, if you had a time machine, that that person in the cross in the middle is going to be the most significant person in all of human history? Can you imagine you trying to convince the Roman soldiers of that? Can you try to imagine going up to Caesar and saying, you know what's crazy? We're going to name your do- our dogs after you. Caesar, you know, Augustus, like all. And we're going to name our children after the disciples of the man hanging on that cross. That's crazy to think about. Now, secondly, for those who may say his friends just made up the story because they wanted to gain from it, from what little we know about church, human, uh, church history in the first 300 years, mostly because Christians were being persecuted, killed, and their writings were being burned, from what little we know about the life of the apostles, we have stories not of them gaining popularity and wealth and fame, but rather being tortured, being shot with arrows to death, being beheaded and crucified for the message 
of saying, man, the guy we lived with for three years, the guy we saw die, we saw him rise again. We know he's God. He's perfect. And we will die rather than to refute what we say. And lastly, I want to end with our last verse, verse 4. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now in the Bible, you see the mention of miracles. For some, that's the very reason why they don't believe in the Bible. And how can I believe in a document that says miracles take place? First of all, you have to wrestle with this idea, man, is God here? Is God ruling and reigning? Does he exist? And if the answer to that question is yes or even possibly, man, there's a lot left on the table. (laughs) There's a lot of miracles left as possibilities on the table. But here he says, a part of why we have miracles is to show the authority of Jesus and his message. That's not the only reason for miracles. If you want some homework, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 are great chapters uh, when it comes to miracles in the church and so on and so forth. But there you see, man, there are, there are reasons for supernatural gifts being given to the church, to correct Christians, to encourage Christians, to love people, to teach the love of God, even to evangelize. Now, there are plenty of reasons for miracles taking place. And he says one of the reasons is to testify about the authority of Jesus. And after all, in Acts chapter 1, we read the apostles were instructed to wait for the arrival of the Holy Spirit. I love this. They got the task. Man, you're going to go into the rest of the world. You're going to tell them about Jesus. And I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And the purpose of the Holy Spirit wasn't to spice up services. It wasn't to make people, like, do crazy things necessarily even though they get the Holy Spirit and a lot of people think they're drunk at that time. But rather, he says, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is that you can be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So let me give you this warning. Don't be obsessed with miracles, but don't dismiss them either. Rather, be focused on the miracle maker. Now, the Bible says... In the end times, there will be false prophets and the Antichrist, and there will be miracles taking place, and a lot of people will follow them because there are miracles taking place. So what are we to make of that then? Wait, if you said Jesus was shown to have authority because of the miracles, and you say false prophets are going to do miracles to lead people astray, how do we know which ones are right and which ones are not? Well, the Bible says, test the spirits if they confess Jesus Christ to be Lord. When God does a miracle, it serves the purpose of elevating the fame of Jesus' name and pointing to the truth of God and Scripture. So be aware of of people who claim to to, uh, do miracles and, and rarely mention Jesus, who claim a lot of healing but never actually point to Jesus. Be aware to not be obsessed with miracles but neglecting the gift of salvation. Right Now, I want to end with this challenge. What is it that you will choose to neglect? Will it be our great Savior who bore the cost of our sin, the penalty of our sin? Or will you choose to neglect other things that your flesh may draw you towards, that the world around you may draw you towards? Because in this life, you cannot serve two masters. What is going to be, who is going to be your functional authority? As you dwell on our great Savior, the great cost of our sin, that's what we do here in communion. We remember the blood of Jesus Christ and the broken body of Jesus Christ. And just like food and drink, it gives life to our body, so the, the death of Jesus Christ gives eternal life to us. We have to ask ourselves, God, this week, how can I honor you? My job is to actually equip you for the work of the ministry that you have. But first, what needs to take place is you need to have a godly vision to what God is calling you to. And I want to be your biggest cheerleader. I don't put that image in your mind. <laughs> I want to cheer you on. I want to help you get there. I want to equip you if I can. How can I use the gifts that God has given me to elevate the fame of Jesus' name? How can I encourage the church around me? How can I build up the church, be it on Sundays or any other day of the week? Do not be an anchorless ship floating around with whatever current is flowing that day, coming to the end of your life filled with regret because you never stop to be intentional about living a godly life. Now, I heard someone say about physical fitness, choose your heart. He said, choose your heart. He said, choose either to get healthy, which is going to be hard. You're going to deny yourself. You're going to exercise, and you're going to reap the benefits. 
or choose the other heart, which is to not deny yourself, not exercise, but your body will ache, you will hurt, you'll be less able to get around. Both are heart. Choose your heart. And so I want to say to you, choose your neglect today. What is it that you're going to neglect? When you walk out of here into this week, are you going to neglect the great salvation of Christ to live for his glory? Or are you going to neglect getting as much money as you could have, could have had? Getting a nice position that you could have had? Because you're going to have to deny one of these masters. Right? And I hope maybe God will bless you in amazing ways, but be faithful. Always look at it in the context of God has given me grace to care for this. May we care for it well. If you're a Christian, I want you to celebrate communion with us, to remind us as we go into this week and we continue to worship God with our lives, with our words, remember why we worship the blood, the body of Jesus Christ. And let's remember as we look at his sacrifice, let's be prayerfully considering, God, what does it look like for me to pick up my cross and follow you? So if you're, not, if you're in here and you're not a Christian, and in our mind, Christian, according to Romans chapter 10, is you've confessed Jesus Christ to be your Lord, meaning your life is not your own anymore, it's his, and you believe that he alone saves you, when you stand before God, it's not, here's all the good works I did. No, Christ died for me. If you believe those two things, then you're a Christian. If you want to make that step today, I would love to talk with you after the service. But if you're not a Christian, please don't take communion with us. The Bible has serious warning about taking communion in an unworthy manner. So may we not mock the cross of Jesus Christ, but may we remember him and may we make much of him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace.